DraftKings contributors Gary and Thor, Matt Meiselman, uh, Roto Wires, Nick Whalen here for some chaser fade. So agree or disagree for me here, guys, with the following DFS or sportsbook plays on tonight's seven game NBA slate. Top price guy on the board, Luka Doncic. Not a huge surprise. He's coming off back to back 75 plus DK fantasy point outings against the Clippers, which included a, a high of 51 points uh, last Thursday. Uh, tonight he gets a much Tougher defensive opponent. We're talking to Miami Heat. So, Chaser Fade, Luca, in your lineups tonight, Nick. You know, I'm not going to tell you to fade Luka Doncic. He's kind of entered that Jokic zone over these last few games. Uh, 65 plus uh, in each of his last three, 70 plus in the last two, like you said. But this is not a great matchup. Heat are number one against the position when it comes to limiting DraftKings production. Uh, so, I would at least entertain some of the other options that we have on the slate. We'll see if Giannis Antetokounmpo, who did not play last night, ends up playing tonight on the second half of the back-to-back. -back. You have Joel Embiid going up against the Celtics. You have Carl Anthony Towns. You got Jason Tatum. You got Trey Young. Uh, a few other guys in that, you know, 8,500 to 9,500 range that you can pair together. Um, so I, I think I'll probably end up fading Luka Doncic. I think he's going to be a popular option, uh, but there, there are just too many other ways to look tonight. I mean, those first, those, those last three games, I should say, where Doncic went off, came against the Detroit Pistons, and then two games against the Clippers, which for some reason, Dodgers just has like this, this vengeance. Whenever he plays the Clippers, he's going to go off, dating back to the last few playoffs. I, I think I wouldn't say things come crashing down against the Heat, but I don't think we're looking at a 70-plus point upside tonight. All right, Gary, and not just the highest-priced guard, but the highest-priced player on this entire slate. You going to squeeze him in? I'll probably have some exposure, but, you know, echoing what Nick was saying, this is clearly not as good a matchup as we've seen in the past. Although I guess the kind of like sneaky secret about the Mavericks is every game they play is a low pace spot because they consistently are the slowest paced team in basketball across like the last half decade. So I'm not really overly concerned about the matchup. Um, although I do think there's a chance just with how expensive he is, how much of a reputation the Heat have, and really just like, the fact that anyone participating in that Timberwolves Hornets game is going to be so popular, including LaMelo Ball, who's just $9,100, that maybe Doncic is a little, his ownership is a little lower than it should be on a slate like this, which is why I'm still a little enticed. But at the end of the day, we're talking about someone who across his last six games has a 43% usage rate and is averaging a 37 point triple double. So I'm going to have him in a couple lineups just out of sheer fear of missing out. All right, Matty, what are you going to do here with the highest price player on the slate? Well, I'm going to wait until we know if Jimmy Butler is playing or not, because he's questionable tonight. And whether or not you have Butler in, I think, is probably going to have a pretty big impact on Luka. I don't know that Butler would guard him the entire game necessarily, but you have to imagine that with Butler's defensive acumen and with Luka being such an important part of the Mavericks offense, basically he's the entire offense. Um, if Butler's out there, he's probably guarding Luka at least some of the time. And without Butler, I think the defense does drop off quite a bit. So I like Luka more if Butler is out. But I'm looking at Giannis. Like, I think Giannis comes back tonight. I think last night was basically resting. Like, they're playing Portland at home. This game is Indiana at home. They called it an ankle injury. But I expect Giannis to be out there. And he's probably going to be the lowest owned of the studs. And he's he also has the best matchup. I mean, the Pacers don't play any defense anymore since Miles Turner got hurt, basically. It's even worse since the trade deadline. Um, if this game does stay close, I think Giannis does really well. And the rest of the team is going to be tired. They just lost at home to Portland last night. Um, a lot of big minutes for guys that don't normally play those minutes. And Giannis didn't play. He was the one resting. So I think Giannis gets back out there, does really well. And if the game does stay within range, Giannis could have a huge game tonight. So he's he's my favorite payup option ahead of Luka. All right, we just mentioned what Luka did against the Clippers. Well, how about Terrence Mann of L.A.? He's been impressive recently. For example, last time out here, Gary, and against Golden State, scores a career-high 25 points and puts up over 40 DK fantasy points at just $4,300 in salary. Tonight, he'll cost you 4 6 against Phoenix. So chase your fade for me, dude. He's a top value play. His salary at this time, like last week, was more than $1,000 less. So what's on the rise here, Gare Bear? Yeah, you have to chase this um i mean is he my favorite value play maybe not but he is a top value play i mean the one concern anything about the clippers all season long has just been how really inconsistent their rotations have been they, they kind of have like seven or eight players who are almost the exact same person and you never really knew how that was gonna translate to that night's rotation but 
with Norman Powell now out for an indefinite period of time with Eric Bledsoe not part of this team anymore, they just don't have a lot of guard depth. And, you know, you look at Mann in the two games since Powell got hurt, he's averaging 35 minutes and he's averaging 1.13 DraftKings points per minute. So if you're going to have that type of volume at a sub 5K price tag, you know, we're not breaking the, we're not reinventing the wheel here. He's just going to be viable. That's, that's simply the way the math works. So I'll shout out like James Booknight, I think is a really nice play. Been averaging about 20 minutes per game at a high usage uh, when he's been healthy lately. I think Jordan Nawara, regardless of whether or not Giannis Antetokounmpo plays tonight is a really good value play at the absolute minimum. But yeah, man is someone who you're going to have to put in a couple lineups. All right, Maddie, one of the Clippers top two threats here on offense because of all the injuries they're dealing with. Yeah, and the other injury they have is Luke Kennard, who didn't play last night. Um, he's likely going to be questionable for today, too. So if he's out, then it's just man kind of has to play a ton. The only reason I'm not necessarily going all in on him, even though I do think he's currently the best value play, is just this could be a slate where we have tons and tons of value, and there might just be other good options that we don't know about yet. So, for instance, if Butler doesn't play, Gabe Vincent, uh, Caleb Martin, some other guys like that, Max Struess, um, but as it stands, I think, yeah, you have to look to the Clippers. If you want to fade man for ownership, Nick Batum is cheap. Amir Coffey is cheap. Those guys are in the mid 3000s. So I think pivoting down to one of those two guys makes some sense. But you kind of have to have a Clipper, I think, in some capacity. And then if Luke Kennard plays, I think he's viable, too. Nick, you see some similar production out of him tonight, as we saw last night against Golden State. So chase your fate for me. He's a top value play. Yeah, I mean, for me, it comes down to Luke Kennard. If Luke Kennard does not play, then we're almost locking in Terrence Mann, I think, for 35 to 40 minutes again because Norman Powell's hurt. They sent out Eric Bledsoe in that trade to Portland. Uh, I mean, he's kind of the last man standing at shooting guard. It's him and Amir Coffey. So I, I, I really haven't been a bit, the biggest fan of Terrence Mann this season. It felt like he had, like, one and a half good games in the playoffs, and everybody decided that he was this next, like, up-and-coming borderline all-star. And he's kind of been disappointing. You know, anybody who drafted him in season long – probably dropped it within the first few weeks of the season. I mean, even before this, this little stretch that he's had here, this last four games, his previous 20 games, he averaged 8.8 points per game on 29% shooting from three. Like, he really hasn't been that that good this season, but you take away all the other options at guard, and all of a sudden he's playing a ton of minutes, and he becomes viable. So, again, if, if Luke Kennard sits, I like Terrence Mann. Uh, but like Matt just said, you know, the roster ship is going to be high. People are, are kind of on the scent now. Uh, so you may want to consider pivoting there. I actually like Isaiah Hartenstein if you want to value play at center on the Clippers. I think he benefits quite a bit from Serge Ibaka landing in Milwaukee. They were kind of running that weird three-center system where Ty Lue said, whoever plays the best in the first half is going to play in the second half. That was a nightmare for fantasy purposes. Now it's just down to Hartenstein and Zubac. All right, guys, let's talk the Sixers here. They're going to host the Celtics tonight, which everyone's thinking, yes, this is going to be sick, but newly acquired James Harden, uh, he's expected to be out through the All-Star break with that hamstring injury. Uh, Celtics, meanwhile, have won eight straight, gotten a boost from their deadline acquisition of Derek White. So Chaser Faye Boston's win streak will continue tonight, Matt. This is going to be sad for me because I've uh, been on the Celtics for months and months and months, and I think we finally have reached the point where they're overvalued. So... I don't know that they're going to lose tonight, but I don't think they're a good bet. We're up to about minus two and a half right now. You have to lay about minus 130, minus 140 now on the money line. I'd rather bet Philly. Like, I think this should be a really even game. If James Harden were playing, then Philly's probably favored. Um, these are even teams, I think, roughly with Harden playing. Without him, Boston's the better team, but on the road, I think that kind of neutralizes the advantage they have. So I really do think this game should be right around Pickham. Uh, the Celtics are better, but the home court advantage in Philly is a big deal. So it just seems like with the winning streak, the Celtics are a little overvalued right now. And it's just, you know, it's it's physically painful for me to talk about it because I've just been yeah. so happy about the Celtics over the last eight wins. But I feel like this could be the spot where the win streak finally ends. Okay, Nick, uh, would you feel like betting the Celtics money line tonight, dude? I don't think I would. I, I'm on the same track. I, I saw that line this morning, and I immediately checked to see if there was some word that Joel Embiid was questionable or maybe Tobias Harris was sitting out. Like, kind of an odd line. Uh, and obviously, you know, Philly sacrificed some depth in that James Harden trade, so they, they won't have Harden. Uh, obviously, they won't have Drummond and Curry, so maybe that's the concern here. But, yeah, I th I'm with Matt. I think this should be closer to a pick -em with Philly at home. So, you know, I, the Celtics have been playing really well. You know, they've won eight straight. Derek White, nice addition. Still not exactly sure what the Celtics are thinking long-term here. It didn't feel to me like they were a Derek White away 
from all of a sudden being a true <laughs> title contender. I don't I don't think I would have given up two first round picks to get Derek White, but you know, I don't know. Maybe it's a nice short term boost for Boston. I would still chase Philly on the money line though. All right, Gary, and would you chase Philly on the money line? It seems like that would be the smart bet. I mean, this line just seems off by a couple points, as Matt was talking about. I mean, Boston, I've, they've kind of finally won me over. I mean, I was at the start of this eight-game winning streak. You kind of go through it game by game. It was like they beat the Pelicans. They beat the Heat with no one playing. They beat the Magic. They beat the Pistons. They beat... Who else? Orlando, Orlando, Charlotte, Brooklyn with no one playing. I was like, all right, this is like kind of a fun schedule quirk thing. Yeah, they're outscoring teams by 19 points per 100 possessions, but this is like the easiest amalgamation of teams I've ever seen. But the wins over Atlanta and Denver were really nice. Derek White fit in, played a really nice role off the bench. Uh, I will say to the Celtics' credit, they are 9-4 and four ATS this season as a road favorite. Philadelphia has not been good against the spread at home, but... That's not enough. Those trends aren't enough for me to just look at this spread and say it's off. And, and I'll, I'll bet Philly tonight. All right, dudes. Um, this next question here. We, ha- we have the Hornets listening to Timberwolves tonight with one of the biggest game totals I think we've seen this season. This, this has to be the biggest one we've seen this season. 244 and a half. It was 243 and a half at the start of the show. Already up a point. That's where it sits right now. Chase your fade that these teams can actually get their neck. I mean, what would be the point of discussing this if I was going to come in here and, and poo-poo this and say, no, yeah. absolutely, it's going under. What the heck? I mean, it's almost the all-star break. Why not? you got to bet the over on this, right? I, I think this absolutely has to be the highest line, maybe by by like four or five points that we've seen this season. I mean, Minnesota's point totals over its last four games, 249, 256, 251, 248. Charlotte, not quite as impressive, 243, 260, 230, 217. But, man, you see that 260. And you're like, I I think this is another opportunity for one of those nights. Minnesota, number one in offensive rating by a pretty good margin over the last 10 games. Both teams top three in pace. Uh, Very weird how cyclical the NBA gets where Minnesota-Charlotte is arguably one of the biggest, most exciting games of the regular season. I'm I'm absolutely chasing the over here. I mean, Garrett, I think everyone expects like a a fun game in this matchup. Two teams vying for a playing spot come postseason time. But man, is it going to be this high scoring? Yeah, I keep going back and forth on this. Uh, like, my brain is saying you've never taken over in a spot this high. But, you know, to Nick's point, <laughs> I kind of want to cheer for it. Yeah. I, I sort of was one of those people, I'm sure a lot of people were, waiting for the Super Bowl to start. You're kind of flipping around channels. What other sports are on? And you end up watching that Timberwolves-Pacers game where I don't think even te- either team, like, knew the definition of the word defense. It, it was insanity. It was and, I, and you really expect a, a script much like that to take place again tonight. I mean, these are two top three teams in pace. As Nick alluded to, Minnesota is averaging almost 122 points per 100 possessions across their last 10 games. Really, the only, the only part of this that worries me is the fact that Charlotte has not been shooting well lately. Maybe they don't hold up their end of the bargain here, but yeah, I'll take the over. Why not? Okay. Maddie, clean sweep. Give it to me. Oh, no, I'm going to keep this one short (laughs) because my answer is way more boring. Like, I just think this is a fair total. We actually do have a little bit of precedent for this because the Wolves just played Chicago with a total that got into the low 240s. So this one is higher, but it's only a couple points higher. Charlotte played Chicago also. I guess Chicago is the team that's most similar to these two in terms of pace and offense and also lack of defense. That total was in the high 230s. Um, Yeah, I think this is about right. Like, these are the top two teams in terms of generating points, just their combination of how fast they play, how well they play offense, and then their struggles on defense, which is more of the thing for Charlotte. Minnesota is okay on defense, but they both play really fast. It just seems right to me. So I'll just watch Boston versus Philly while this game is on. They're roughly at the same time. Like, I I, I just feel like I'm not going to worry about this one. That's a better game, more important with better teams.